I try to start without having any ideas at all, in fact, without any conscious plan, particularly a conscious plan, because it seems to me that that sort of ingenious activity of the front of your mind prevents the really serious emergence of things which appear to happen by themselves, but which quite clearly come from another part of one's mind. In this uh, worksheet, which is the uh, sort of thing that I do practically every day, I have no scheme before I start, but what happens is that as the drawing commences to develop on the sheet, there is an action on my imagination which gives me the clue to what's going to happen next. That's to say, it seems to be controlled from somewhere else. The consequences that I'm pursuing doing this are not, of course, logical. They're very often completely irrational, and I can find no explanation for them afterwards. involvement uh, in the sense of an interest in flow, in water, air, wind, the movement of things, the rhythm of existence, particularly in rhythms, because after all, we live in a complete world of rhythms, all information that arrives to us, or which we impart to anybody else, is done in terms of rhythm. And uh, I think that one can easily have an instinctive feeling that this is perfectly authentic. This is an authentic language. And it's also a language that perhaps is not very well understood. And it therefore becomes a subject that can preoccupy you for almost an indefinite period, like most of your life. Stanley William Hayter, artist and printmaker, was born at Hackney in London in 1901. He started painting in his early teens and shared this activity with a strong leaning towards the sciences. After studying chemistry and geology at King's College London, he went to Abadan on the Persian Gulf to work for the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company as an organic chemist. Suddenly, he decided to abandon the prospect of a successful career as a scientist and returned to England at the age of 25 with a firm conviction that he must devote his energies to the arts. Drawn, like so many artists at that time, to Paris, he settled there and has continued to live there ever since, except for ten years when he was working in New York. In 1927, his second year in Paris, Hayter founded a workshop to carry out research into the methods and techniques of printmaking, which became known as the Atelier 17. This was not a studio in the sense of a place where formal instruction would be given to students, but rather a meeting ground for like-minded people where experimentation in the medium could be carried out. Sir Herbert Reed once wrote of it, the art of gravure, before the foundation of Atelier 17, was an art that had not realized half its potentialities. In the 20s, when the workshop was first set up, it did really occur to me that although people had done quite remarkable things in finding new means of painting and of visual communication, yet in the art of etching and engraving, they were still applying to quite modern material methods of the 19th century, which were, of course, intended for reproduction. Now, it's true that at a much earlier time, in the 15th century, Poneolo and Mantegna made plates which quite clearly were originated for the plate itself. But unfortunately, within a comparatively short time, this art of engraving became converted to making reproductions of the works of well-known painters. Uh, there was very little invention, technical invention, for the purpose of going outside of the domain of painting, of drawing, of sculpture, which existed already, which is, of course, the sort of thing that we've had in mind to 
find something in the medium which is unlike anything that could be done in any other medium. During the 20s and 30s, Paris was seething with experimental ideas. The most active and revolutionary artists were the surrealist painters and poets, many of whom became close friends of Hayter. Their belief in finding the sources of inspiration in the subconscious, the stress they placed on the irrational elements in art, and the necessity of being guided by chance and spontaneous reactions coincided with the discoveries that Hayter had been making independently, and which were to dominate the methods and techniques that he and the artists working at Atelier 17 were to develop. One of the oldest of the traditional methods of printmaking is the use of the burin to incise the plate. And handle rests in the palm of your hand. Then you extend your forefinger like that lightly and double up those fingers so that in your way. And you hold quite lightly. Now, we shall put the point of the burin in at that angle. Now we'll swing the plate. And you see, I can do it without looking what I'm doing because it isn't done only with the eye, it's done with the touch. There is something very peculiar about the engraved line, uh, which is cut by a sharp tool forward into the plate. It is driving a tool against the resistance of the plate, which is turning, so that the forces are very simple. One push and one turn. The drawn line, as it says, is drawn, is pulled. It's something that happened behind the point that you're working with. The Burin line is looking forward, and it consequently has to do with another sense, a sense of pursuing something rather than tracing something or recording something which has already been done, which has already been experienced. When you compare the two, it becomes quite clear that one of them has a different sense, a different implication than the other. When you are cutting with a burin, you are not drawing. You are pushing ahead into some unknown territory. A moving present is looking forward into the future. Very steadily. See, we could quite easily follow that curve again if we wanted to. Right. Now, I want you to look at something, and that is, you see that finger? It's got a mark in it. Well, that's because you're pressing too hard here. That means you're driving with the brake on. <laughs> you see? <laughs> so, try not to press with that finger. Try to keep it just, just to point with it like that, but not press. The other traditional method of working a plate for printmaking is by etching it with acid. Etching is one of the most elaborate and uh, awkward methods of making a black mark appear on a white piece of paper. In order for it to make any sense, the remoteness of the operation should be a definite advantage to you. That is to say, in the terms of this remoteness, these consequences which are not always to be anticipated, some matter should arise that was not present in your mind as you start to do it so that the remoteness the awkwardness if you like the elaboration of this process should be working to your advantage and not to your disadvantage at his studio in the rue cassini hater begins work on an etching the zinc plate has been covered with a sheet of self-adhesive plastic which will act as a resist to the acid in which the plate will later be placed. The advantage of the plastic is that it can be cut very precisely and the piece is removed, etched and put back again afterwards. A wave-shaped pattern of lines is drawn onto the plastic for the template. is taped to the back of the plate so that it will swing freely. The art 
Bullet lines are then cut through the plastic with a knife. The elements between these cuts will then be removed, etched, and can be replaced. In recent years, Hayter has been increasingly interested in the relationships and interaction of elemental forms. The elements or shapes that he's working with in this plate are two sets of expanding wave-shaped curves running along the diagonals of the plate, one set of bow curves, also expanding, and two circles. We can get a border line by cutting into the plastic with a burin. There, too, you see the hand hardly moves and the plate swings so that you get a very simple curve. Now I'm going to take out a series of elements from the pattern in between the lines that have been cut, leaving these open spaces to be attacked by the acid. When the plate is printed, the image will be laterally inverted. The final print will be the mirror image of the plate from which it is printed. For this reason, it is essential for a printmaker to think in terms of the mirror image when working on his plate. To think and work the other side of the mirror. The first set of these elements is removed and the plate will now go into the acid. After this plate has been bitten, the elements will be replaced and a new set removed. In the case of this plate, four different sets of elements have been removed and replaced, two different textures being used, and two different degrees of open bite. Now we have the plate, which has been bitten and is complete. But the process of making the print is only about half done. There are parts of the plate which are still intact. The original surface is still there. Parts where it's been bitten slightly. Parts where it's been bitten quite deeply to another level. Then there are textures that have been put in the soft ground. And these can be in the original surface, as in this case. In other cases, in the bottom of the hollow that's been bitten out. So there are actually a large number of variants. Traditionally, if you required a print in full colour, the printmaker made several plates, inked them in different colours, and printed them one after the other in register on a single sheet of paper. Finding this method rather cumbersome and inflexible, Hayter devised an alternative and more direct method of colour printing from a single plate and using only one pass under the press. In our method, the plate is first inked in the normal way with an intaglio colour which is worked into the grooves in the plate. Excess ink is then wiped off the surface so that color is only held in the bottom of the grooves in the plate. If a trial proof were struck at this stage, the result would be a print showing the overall outlines and densities of the plate. The next two colors are applied with rollers, one of which is hard and quite large in diameter, so that it penetrates very little into the hollows of the plate and deposits color only in the unetched areas. The large roller is re-inked and passed over the plate in the opposite direction. The intaglio color is completely transformed by the passage of the green roller. The other roller
color is softer and charged with a more sticky ink. It penetrates more deeply into the hollows, which the hard roller skimmed over. But the stickier yellow ink is rejected by the ink already laid down, so that this color takes only in the spaces missed by the hard roller. The plate is now fully inked and is taken to the press. seldom mixed together before being applied. And in one particular print, it's very unlikely that I should use more than three, uh, the interference between these three will give me all of the color that's necessary, both through the transparency on the plate and the different ways in which the color, the intaglio color, is held inside the plate. This one is called the window. And it's an image that I must have been very familiar with for years and years and years before I finally saw it. Look, it's actually what you see looking out of the window of a train. You see, down this end, the leaves, the foliage that you're passing, is in focus. You can see each leaf. Here it's beginning to melt a bit. As it goes off here, to the left of the picture, it's melting away into the streamers. And that perfectly rectangular window as it disappears out of the corner of your eye going past you, opens up into a parabolic form, which is why this thing goes there. This one's called calculus, because in actual fact, it is all about mathematics. A mathematician asked me to make this thing, which, and it was used for the cover of a book of his. And of course, in it, all the forms are actually Geometric forms, uh, cardioids, ellipses, uh, lemniscates. This, in a way, is the other end of the spectrum from the perfectly immediate representational thing we just looked at. This one here is a series of consequences. And we see what happens out of these consequences being accumulated one after another. And nobody knew what this was going to look like. Particularly, I myself didn't know what it was going to look like until it was done. This is one of a series of engravings that I did to illustrate Cervantes' Numantia, and it was done for Volard, but uh, as he died before the series was complete, they were never published in that way, published separately afterwards. From the 1930s onward, Pater has illustrated the works of a number of poets and authors, such as Paul Eloi, George Unier and Aragon. His most recent work in that direction is three illustrations for a short text entitled Still, which was written especially by Samuel Beckett to be published in this way. Hayter and Beckett collaborated closely during the making of the plates to ensure that the images corresponded to the imagination of the author as well as that of the artist. As well as being a printmaker and the motivating force behind the Atelier 17, Ata has throughout his life remained very active as a painter and divided his time equally between that and printmaking. The relation between the paintings and the prints, of course, is extremely simple. That is, the same person did them. Now, that he would do the same thing in a canvas he had done on a plate, or the same thing in a plate that had already been done on a canvas, 
to a person really familiar with the two means of expression would be absurd. There is not merely the difference of scale, which is enormous and specific. Something twice as big is as different as blue is from red. It's not just bigger. But there is also the fact that the situation of the artist to his surface, his plate, his canvas, is completely different. At the same time, things arrive in a painting which can be extremely valuable, exploited in a completely different fashion, engraving or etching. The canvas that Hayter is starting will be based on a number of carefully selected forms or themes, which are laid out on the canvas and make up the underlying structure of all the work that will follow. This painting, like a lot of paintings that I've done in recent times, is going to be a sort of game of consequences. There are four elements, all of which are systematic, but the consequences between them, of course, cannot be foreseen. The first one, of course, is the grid which is constituted by the eight canvases, small canvases, which together make the big picture. The second one is a bow curve, a repeated bow curve, which starts from the lower left corner and goes up to the upper right corner. The third element is a more or less erratic to and fro movement starting horizontally and passing fanwise across the canvas. Once all this design has been laid out, as it has been on the canvas, there is a preparation made of white on white so that each color which is going to be employed will appear in two versions, one brighter than the other. Not forgetting his early training as a scientist, Ata has investigated the relationship between the theme he sets himself and its spontaneous growth while he is at work. He is able to establish a dialogue in which the work speaks to him and sparks off new discoveries. The imagination works in an irrational way and creates its own subjective reality. A lot of people think a scientist works with great precision, measuring and observing things and writing them down. Of course, in actual fact, a scientist doesn't work like that. He works quite irrationally at certain times. He guesses and imagines. And the careful verification of his guesses is, of course, the part that the public generally remembers. From that point of view, the way we work on painting and printmaking, drawing and so forth, it's very similar to the way the scientist works, because it is a series of irrational consequences, which in some way have to be verified, otherwise nothing will be there definite you see. But at the same time, their source is in what people call the imagination, that faculty that forms images. And I would insist that all serious scientists come to their work in that same way. This research into the imagination, which Hayter first became interested in through his work with the Surrealists in the 1930s, extends to his teaching methods at the Atelier 17. There, too, the approach is experimental, and the aim is to provide experience rather than information. Of course, a lot of the people who come here to work have been told that here in Paris there's a chap that knows all about printmaking. He will tell them, and they'll know all about it. This is nonsense. And this attitude of mind, we try to break down as fast as possible. In fact, what we're trying to show them is it doesn't like that. Whatever knowledge I may have of this subject, I cannot possibly take out of my head and put into theirs. That knowledge was the result of experience of a lot of things that have happened to me. And the best we can do is to organize things so that an awful lot of things are going to happen to them. This will be their knowledge, their experience, it will be individual, unlike that of any other individual, and unlike my knowledge of this matter. The reason that we introduce every newcomer in the workshop to a certain kind of line which can be traced only when one is completely relaxed is that this character of line is precise, is sure, and is generally unknown to them unfamiliar. This permits them to make a starting point in their experiment which is a completely unfamiliar structure 
on the notion that in unfamiliar conditions discovery can be made. Through the years, a number of experimental methods of teaching have been developed by Hayter to promote an intuitive use of the medium. These are centered around the first plate made by a newcomer to Atelier 17. The line system made in this way is used to form a structure. This structure is then developed by successive transformations to the virtual destruction of the plate. The beginning will end with a complete pack of successive prints of the transformations of this plate, which will then be put up on the wall, and we shall together analyze what has happened there. At this point, we can see that curve as being convex. Here, we can see it as a cave that's going inward. That means that our structure, instead of being fixed and solid, is like something made of wire, which can flip inward or outward as we work on it. Now, if we were attempting to imitate a model already made here, this would be a strong disadvantage. But if we're going to attempt to work as we are here by transformations, then obviously this can be interesting because it means we haven't got to invent all our transformations. Some of them will happen by themselves and all we have to do is to observe them and to accept them or reject them. Because if we're not in a position either to accept or reject, then there's every chance that we get lost. And when we come to use color, you see, we're bringing together two things, which is the constructed space you used here, the structure space, and a color space, which happens the moment we put one color there. Some of this space disappears when we put color here, but if the color, a warm color, which appears to come forward, is applied to this which is outside, we've merely fixed that in that position. It is now practically impossible to see that in front. When, however, we put a cold color on there, we can then see this space as an interior space like that space we saw in the mirror. And at this moment, you see that the color, the space color, has inverted the structured, constructed space we had here and we had here. <laughs> I don't know about patterns of understanding. And that's what we're doing. We're not transmitting the look of something. We're not talking about something that's going on elsewhere. We're talking about how it is with you, how it is with your mind. We're passing on patterns of understanding out of our mind, which we hope to be recognized in part by somebody else's mind. <laughs> For nearly 50 years, the Atelier 17 has remained at the forefront of modern printmaking, bringing together artists from all parts of the world to add to and draw from its vast fund of expertise. It has acted as a catalyst for the talents of literally hundreds of printmakers and pioneered and developed many new methods and techniques. In fact, there are few modern printmakers whose work has not in some way been affected by its existence. But the atelier's contribution to the arts does not depend only on the brilliance of new techniques. It is its approach to the ways of realizing the inner workings of the imagination and an understanding of the function of a work of art that have opened up vast possibilities, helped by the ingenuity and guidance of Stanley William Hayter. This general notion of pursuing an issue that can't be foreseen has always been one of the things I've done in painting and engraving and drawing because um, this is where you want to see what happens next. So I once had to tell a critic who said, uh, which is the painting, which of your paintings are you most interested in? And I said, the one I haven't yet done. You're thinking of what the next move is, where you can go from that position. I can remember one critic who said, uh, do you know what the paintings would look like before you started? And without a moment's hesitation, I said, well, of course. If I knew what it was going to look like before I started it, there's no point in starting it at all. The thing's gone already. Mm -hmm.